CNN has learned that the former president is planning to attend arguments next week in his appeals court case on presidential immunity. The story was first reported by The New York Times. Joining us is CNN legal analyst and former Deputy Assistant Attorney General Elliot Williams, also former federal prosecutor Jessica Roth. She currently teaches at New York's uh, Cardoza School of Law. And Maggie Haberman, CNN political analyst, The Times' is senior political correspondent and author of the great book, Confidence Man, The Making of Donald Trump and the breaking of America. Jessica, what stands out to you about the, the president's ruling? Or well, he throws a lot into this brief. I mean, it's presented as one question presented of, did the Colorado courts get this wrong? So it's sort of, in a sense, presented as this one simple question. But when you actually go on and read the filing, it encompasses at least 10 other arguments that are all part of what the Colorado court decided. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really uh, sort of a kitchen sink approach, as we were talking about. I think the thing that is most, I think, compelling and that the Supreme Court most might find most persuasive as a reason to take it up is this argument that he's presented before, that if you allow the states, all 50 states, to make their own determination about whether or not he's qualified to be on the ballot for president, that that really invites chaos um, and that the Supreme Court should step in and really settle this question of whether or not actually the states even have the authority to make these determinations pursuant to the procedure set forth in state law. To me, that's the most compelling part of the presentation. I mean, that, that's a rational argument. It is a rational argument, and it's an important question that the Supreme Court really should decide promptly as we go forward in the election process in all 50 states. Maggie, how much do you think the former president is betting on favorable Supreme Court intervention, whether it's the issue of ballot qualification or immunity from prosecution? I think those are different cases. I don't think that his folks are particular, or he are particularly optimistic that he, they're going to win on the presidential immunity. Although, as you, as you said, I reported earlier that he is going to show up next week for arguments that he's not going to be able to be part of, but he will be there and it will create a, a spectacle, certainly. On this question, which is a separate one, his team feels more confident that the Supreme Court is going to go with him. He has said that himself, but he has also said to other people, and one of his lawyers uh, confirmed this reporting earlier today, he has said to some people he's concerned that the justices who he appointed are going to be afraid of looking like they're taking his side politically and not doing that. And some of that is because he has been very angry, as you know, at the justices he appointed that they haven't gone his way. They've, they've gone his way on policy matters on a number of cases. They have not on his election-related cases. Why is he going to show up? And is it simply because it will create a spectacle? I, number one. Number two, he sees himself as his own best defender and communicator right now, and he believes that he can impact all of these things best, and that if he hasn't tried, as it's been described to me by people who have spoken to him, on this particular issue, that he will um, regret it if it doesn't go his way. Um, will he fundraise? I mean, he can also fundraise. He fundraise off everything. He fundraises off everything. This, I suspect, will not be an exception. Elliot, the, the former president's legal team, they're arguing, they're filing that his speech at the Ellipse on January 6th called for peaceful protests. I just want to play some of, of what he said. We fight. We fight like hell. And if you don't fight like hell, you're not going to have a country anymore. I know that everyone here will soon be marching over to the Capitol building to peacefully and patriotically make your voices heard. So, as you know, the Colorado Supreme Court found that the speech should not be protected by the First Amendment because it incited violence. How do you see it? Uh, well, I, I think to reach the point of incitement, the, the the tie between the statement and the violence has to be quite imminent, and that's a tricky legal question. You know, look, frankly, I don't think it's in anybody's interest to start getting in the weeds of whether a statement was insurrection or, or, you know, or incited insurrection or not. And I think this picks up on Jessica's point from a moment ago about this whole idea of the kitchen sink in the president's brief, that the Supreme Court does not even have to touch the insurrection question because there are countless other ways to avoid uh, getting into the quagmire of picking apart individual statements or lines from the president. What I think they try to do is reach some point of unanimity or, or, or near unanimity over one of these questions over, for instance, is the president an officer of the United States? Is the president, does he take the same oath as other people, therefore is he exempt from the provisions in the 14th Amendment that would, uh, that would apply here? Um, because of how fraught and complicated and politically sensitive this insurrection question is and very difficult legally to sort out, I think they just avoid it altogether. And, and frankly, it's probably more in the president's interest to, and, and the court's interest to say, well, look, he's a, forget insurrection. He's a candidate for office, and 
people who are speaking in the context of the political process generally are afforded more more latitude to speak. Yeah, Maggie, when you look back at that speech, I mean, you know, he talks about fighting and fight like hell, and he used that term a, a lot. Um, it, he does that. I mean, the, he uses the words that can be interpreted in, yes. in multiple ways. I mean, that's part of his, his thing. Yes. I mean, he often walks up to a line. The question is whether legally he crossed one. I think in terms of um, responsible behavior, I think there are a number of people who have uh, described that speech as condemnable uh, and contemptible, but that doesn't necessarily make it um, legally questionable. And I think mm -hmm. that's the issue here. Uh, especially since we learned in the January 6th hearings that, that he knew that there were guns in the crowd, people had, had, had weapons. Correct. He often tries to leave himself some kind of public out. And I think that's what uh, folks like the main Secretary of State were looking at. And, and Jessica, there's also the matter of the, the separate appeal filed by the, the Colorado GOP. How does that differ from the arguments made by the former president? Yeah, so that's really interesting. The Colorado GOP made two of the same arguments that Trump has made in his brief, including whether he's a, an officer within the meaning of Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, um, and also whether or not the Section 3 of the 14th Amendment is self-executing, or whether Congress essentially has to enact legislation that authorizes states to make these determinations or some other way of determining whether or not he's disqualified by Section 3. And then they made an additional point about whether their First Amendment rights as a party were violated by the, the, the action here. But Trump goes on to make these additional arguments, including whether or not he engaged in insurrection. The Colorado Republican Party didn't raise that question. And so the, their petition, if it, uh, the only petition presented to the U.S. Supreme Court, wouldn't be asking the court to actually review the determination of the Colorado Supreme Court affirming the ruling of the district court that Trump did engage in insurrection. Now, I suspect the court will not grant cert on that question, that they will probably resolve this question um, on the issue of whether he's an officer under Section 3 and whether or not the section is self-executing. But if they were to rule against Trump on those two legal questions, then they actually would have to reach the question of whether he engaged in insurrection. I suspect that he raised those issues on appeal because he also wants to be contesting those determinations. The Colorado Republicans didn't contest those. So it remains to be seen whether the court will grant cert on those additional questions and whether they will reach them if they take the case and how they ultimately resolve it. I mean, you referenced this earlier. The former president's attorneys, they're arguing that the so-called insurrectionist ban doesn't apply to the presidency. And, and the Section 3 of the 14th Amendment does not specifically mention the presidency, which is true. It says officer of the United States. The counterargument is, does it make any sense that the authors, the Constitution, would ban yeah. insurrectionists from holding virtually every other job in the government, both civil and military, and not the highest office in the country? Right. It's sort of preposterous as a matter of plain language. You and I talking, saying that the president of the United States is not an officer of the United States is, is ludicrous. However, read the language of the Constitution. And it is quite clear uh, that they say, frankly, there's another provision in the Constitution that says the president, comma, vice president, comma, and officers of the United States, suggesting that the term officer of the United States does not intend to apply to the president. Again, it's one of these many areas in the law in which our understanding of what terms mean and what the framers put on paper are, are completely different. Now, this is, Anderson, why we have a Supreme Court. It exists for the purpose of sorting out these complica complicated legal questions, frankly, precipitated by the mess that the framers left us. In their wisdom, there are ambiguities in the Constitution and they have to be sorted out. And this is precisely one of them. And even if they don't touch this question, this is, as Trump says in his brief, of critical importance to the American people and needs to be resolved. Elliot Williams, Jessica Roth, Maggie Haberman, thanks.